It's good to have you here today, and it's a joy, to, as always, to welcome in those of you who are joining us live online, or maybe who are catching this later in the week in the archived version. It's good to have you be a part of Freedom Church. Uh, we all are familiar with the, the term wounded warrior. That's uh, something that in the last 12 or 13 years has become uh, well known across the country, this organization that is designed to minister to and, and help meet the needs of the men and women who have been overseas, been in battle, and who have suffered significant injuries and are going to have a difficult time transitioning back to normal life. And so it's such a great organization that is designed to help address those specific wounds and challenges that it brings with it. Well, uh, that's a really cool thing in the physical. Well, we're going to talk today about wounds that many of us carry, not because we've been on the battlefield, but because of what life has done to us. And we're going to do that by looking together as sort of the original wounded warrior in Scripture. If you haven't been here the last couple of weeks, I'll tell you that we are uh, in a summer series. It's sort of a, a story series where we're looking at, at some significant characters in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. And it's a series entitled Unexpected Heroes. The subtitle of the series is From Dysfunction to Distinction. We're looking at people who, when you really get down to it, just had such brokenness, such big issues in their lives, and yet God still chose to use them in a significant way, this is a series of hope for us because it's a reminder that with all of our junk, all of our struggles, that God still loves people like us. And it gives him great pleasure to pursue and to greatly use people like you and me. And the character that we're going to look at today is one whose name is probably not just on the tip of your tongue. His name is Jephthah. If I started out by saying, now I want everyone to turn now with me to the story of Jephthah in the Bible. If you didn't have your outline in front of you, wouldn't you struggle with that one? We'd all be looking for the concordance. It's like, yeah, I think the story of Jephthah is right after that verse that says, God helps those that help themselves. I think it's over there in Hezekiah or one of those books like that. Uh, well, actually, the story of Jephthah is in the book of Judges. Uh, it's chapters 10, 11, and 12. If you'll go ahead and turn there in your Bibles with me. We're going to focus in mostly on the second half of chapter 10 and chapter 11. Just in case you weren't here last week, uh, I'll just remind you of where we are in history. The book of Judges bridges two significant parts of Israel's history. Uh, the first five books of the Bible have been about, uh, once we get beyond creation and the early earliest chapters. It's about the, the movement of God's people out of Egypt, the 40 years in the wilderness and getting to the Holy Land. And then the book of Joshua uh, spans about 20 or 30 years. It's about the going in and taking of the Holy Land. If you jumped ahead and you just skipped over two books, and when you get to the books of Samuel and Kings and Chronicles, those tell the stories of the people of God, the Israelites under the kings, Saul, David, Solomon, and beyond in the divided kingdom. But between those two periods where once they went in and took possession of the land, they were just this confused, uh, not organized at all group of people, a couple of million people who've just gone in to possess the land. And they, they have a very weak sense of national identity and they aren't under any one ruler. And there's about 300 years that pass in between the taking of the land and they're actually becoming a king and a centralized idea of we are one people under God. And during those 300 years in between is the period of the judges. We said last week the judges didn't look anything like a judge today. These were charismatic leaders that were anointed by God. The Spirit of God would come upon them and they would arise in moments of crisis to lead the people. Normally, they wouldn't be leaders of the entire nation. These would be regional leaders who would deal with regional opposition. And so last week, we talked about one of the early judges whose name was Gideon, uh, a, a great character, a great story. This week, we're going to be looking at a story that is far less known, but it is one of the six cycles that we talked about last week. We said in the span of those 300 years, in the span of the book of Judges, six different times we ride this roller coaster up and down, up and down. It's the same cycle repeated six times in Judges, and the cycle is very easy to define. The Israelites, the people of God, would go from a time of blessing to a time where it's like, well, I kind of forget that God's the one who's taking care of us and blessing us, and we start chasing after our own things and our own ways, and, and we start worshiping other gods and doing things we know that we shouldn't be doing, and as a result, the protection of God departs, and oftentimes, this, the chastisement of God would come in the form of some invading people. Some ite would come in. 
Last week it was the Midianites. This week it's going to be the Ammonites. Next week it'll be the Termites. Some ite would come and, and attack God's people. And they would overwhelm them and oppress them for some number of years. And then eventually the people of God would wake up and go, Wow, I think we've really messed up. We've made a terrible mistake. We should turn back to God. God, would you please help us? Would you please save us? And at some point, God would raise up a deliverer. He would raise up a new judge to be the leader, and he would call the army out, and then they would go and fight some series of battles, and there would be a season of freedom and blessing again. Six different times in those 300 years that they repeated this cycle. Well, today is going to be another repetition of essentially that same cycle, but the key character in this, his name is Jephthah, and I'm going to tell you that, that while this story on the surface is really wacky. I, I told you when we started diving into some of the stuff in Judges, it's, it's bloody and some of it's really unusual, but I'm going to tell you, if you'll hold on today, you will find that this is more than just a repetitious story, that this is going to be a story that speaks to every single one of us, to some of the deepest, most life-defining issues, struggles, and wounds that we've ever dealt with. And so, uh, as the story begins, this portion of the story, it really starts kind of uh, part of the way through chapter 10. And we could just say, and like last week, these are not sermon points. These are just kind of parts of the story to, to bring us along. And the story begins really with 18 years of rebellion and misery that led Israel to finally cry out to God in repentance that we see in chapter 10. We, we read beginning in verse 6 that again the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. This is a, a phrase that gets repeated over and over once again. They served the Baals and the Ashtoreths and the gods of Aram, the gods of Sidon, and the gods of blah, 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 blah. They just served a bunch of pagan gods. And because the Israelites forsook the Lord and no longer served Him, He became angry with them. He sold them into the hands of the Philistines and the Ammonites, who that year shattered and crushed them. For 18 years they oppressed all the Israelites on the east side of the Jordan. 18 years. I'm always sort of interested as we watch this sort of cycle get repeated again and again to just see how long it takes the people to finally wake up and realize, man, we've been stupid. Why don't we turn back to God? You know, when we started with Jacob two weeks ago, remember how many years it took him of being stupid and living in a miserable place? How many years? 20 years before he finally got right with God and changed how he lived. Last week, in, this, in the period of Gideon, you remember how long they lived under the awful oppression of the Midianites? Seven years before that generation woke up and turned to God. This time around, different generation, 18 years. I, I mean, as I was just thinking about that this week, I mean, for those of you who've raised kids, think about from the birth of your child until they graduate from high school, 18 years old, and how long that can be. Can you imagine living under severe oppression, used and abused and enslaved by foreign people for 18 years before finally having the good sense to wake up and say, maybe we ought to get right with God. Maybe we ought to put things in order. It's easy to read that and just go, man, these people are stupid. I mean, how is it that they're so slow to come around? And yet I, I look at, at how we live so many times and how we'll be stubborn and hold on to things that we know we shouldn't be doing or, or shy away from things that we know God has called us to and how we can spend years in those places and many times suffer as a result before we finally wake up and go, oh yeah, I guess I probably should do business with God and maybe that would help to alleviate some of the misery that I or my family have been going through. You know what the part of the moral of this portion of the story is? <laughs> God's got all the time in the world. <laughs> he will outlast you. He will outweigh you. If you think that you and I are going to get our agenda over on God, go back and read the stories because he will wait just as long as it takes. And he will allow just as much pressure as is necessary to bring change in us. Well, it, it, you know, the cycle repeated itself once again after 18 years of misery. They turn back to God, and it's sort of funny what God says in response. They're crying out, oh, God, we're so sorry, and we repent. We'll go to Sunday school and read our Bibles. We'll be good Christians. No, they're not Christians yet, but we'll be good Jews. And in response to that, God says, what's that you say? You're crying out for help. If you need help, I suggest you call out to the gods you've been serving the last 20 years. Why don't you call out to Baal? Why don't you call out to Ashtoreth? You call on any of those gods you want to because you've been serving them. So let them come and save you. 
ouch. <laughs> he's, he's bringing a little attitude to the conversation here. And the people just continue to persist. And they're saying, oh God, do to us anything that you want to. But would you please get rid of these stupid Ammonites? We are, we are tired of this. We need some relief. And it says that God just finally got to the point that he just could not stand watching the suffering of his people as they've turned back to him. And so he intervenes. And it's like the, the writer of Judges is doing a good job of setting us up. So now God's about to do something. What's he going to do? And then he just sort of goes, okay, hold that thought. Freeze. He's, we know he's going to raise up a deliverer. It is the book of Judges. We're about to get a new judge. But now, just like any good movie or any good book, now we're going to stop and we're going to back up and we're going to give you some backstory about the deliverer. His name is Jephthah. And so the next portion of the story is we introduce to you the guy that God's going to use in a big way, the guy with a strange name, and he begins chapter 11 by saying, and, and I, I love how Peterson in the, the message just lays it out straight. He says, Jephthah the Gilead, Gileadite was one tough warrior. He was the son of a whore, but Gilead was his father. That's pretty straight talk, isn't it? Meanwhile, yeah, some of you are going, is that in the Bible? It's right there. <laughs> Meanwhile, Gilead's legal wife had given him other sons. And when they grew up, his wife's sons threw Jephthah out. They told him, you're not getting any of our family inheritance. You're the son of another woman. So Jephthah fled from his brothers. It is a very tragic and painful beginning to the Jephthah story that we, we don't know a great deal beyond the fact that his mother was a prostitute and his dad was a respectable man, at least some level of respectable. You have to bear in mind, in those days, men could get away with a lot and women had so few rights. It wasn't like a wife could particularly protest that her husband is out enjoying himself with a prostitute. Well, he actually gets the prostitute pregnant and he does the semi-respectable thing of he at least accepts that he is the father of the child that this prostitute has. And so he takes him in and, you know, embraces him as his son, at some level embraces him. But he has other sons by his actual wife. And as these kids are coming up, there's no secret about the fact that Jephthah has a different mother. Not just a different mother, he has a prostitute for a mother. And so the other brothers despise him for it. You know, you can only imagine the things that they said to him and called him. The, the writer here says that they referred to him as the son of another mother. Well, that's probably the nice, nicest thing they called him. You son of another mother is probably the, the nicest slur. I mean, you can just only imagine the abuse that he took to the point that apparently before it was even the time and age that he would, you know, go out and live his own life, that he just fled he fled to escape the abuse. His dad wouldn't protect him. Who knows where his mom is in all of this. All of this junk going on in Jephthah's life is shaping him to become a particular kind of man. And, and we can just say to sum up this portion of the story that terrible mistreatment created both major strengths and dysfunctions in Jephthah's life. He's just deeply wounded. I mean, think about the things that are going on from these earliest days all the different types of rejection and wounding that are taking place. I mean, okay, he's watching his mom, and in his mother, he sees anything but a picture of stability and real intimacy, right? I mean, watching his mother sleep with a different man every night. He's getting a picture that is anything but love, and that, that's his picture of a relationship. Well, on the other hand, he's got a dad married to another woman, and dad sort of accepts him, but not as a full-fledged son, and when the brothers and others are abusing him and just doing the awful things that kids can do, dad won't protect him. And when it finally comes down to it, life is so miserable at home that he just has to run away and make it on his own when he's not old enough to be doing that. Can you begin to imagine the deep wounds that are being left there? I mean, he knows nothing of security. He knows nothing of real love and acceptance. And so what winds up happening is he does develop one great strength. I mean, how does the story begin? Boy, that Jephthah, he was one great warrior. What's the one thing Jephthah learned out of all that? Well, everybody's just 
abusing him verbally and probably physically with these brothers, he just learned how to fight. He learned to be just as tough as a lighter knot. But in that, man, he learned a lot of other stuff. He learned a lot of unhealthy stuff because of how deeply he was wounded. Now, here's the thing that I want you to consider this morning. Probably every person, but at least most every person in this room watching and listening online is carrying some kind of woundedness. Many are carrying some type of really significant deep wound. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you that these most likely did not come at the hands of a school teacher or a good friend or a casual acquaintance or a Sunday school teacher. The kind of wounds that I'm talking about, they came through a parent or a spouse or a fiance or possibly a sibling. For some, they came from through some other person that you should have been able to trust, but who did the unthinkable to you. And unfortunately, many of us feel like because of that wound, I'm the freak in the room. Everybody else here is normal. Everybody else here is okay, and I feel so broken because of this thing that I know is not right in me. And that thing comes from a variety of different sources. For some, it, it comes from something like having been physically or sexually abused while a child or an adolescent. That always leaves a terrible wound. It's not the person's fault. It's not the child's fault. It's not the teen's fault. But they walk away with a terrible wound in their heart. Some listening have a terrible wound as a result of having grown up with an alcoholic parent or a parent who's an addict. Maybe your dad just drank all the time or was a binge drinker. Maybe mom was hooked on pills. And as a result, their behavior was really erratic and, and the ways that they tried to express love got really twisted into something that wasn't very loving. And it's impossible for you to walk away from that without bearing very deep wounds as a result. Some bear the scars and wounds of having had an absent parent. Mom or dad that bailed out or there was, there was a divorce and one of them was just gone. And even though from a distance they were nice maybe, it can't change the fact that their absence on a daily basis in, your, basis in your life leaves a deep wounding. No way around it. For some, it wasn't apparent. For many, the deepest wound came through the person that you gave your heart to. You were going to love them for the rest of your life. They were going to love you forever. They were going to be your best friend forever. And that love got violated. And you felt deeply violated. Some of the wounds that we carry are self-inflicted. Sometimes we're the ones who've done to others. And unfortunately, as we'll see in this story, this wounding thing is cyclical. Wounded people wound people. Hurt people hurt people. People who carry terrible, deep wounds that don't heal over time, if something isn't done to address that, will wound other people. We're going to see in this story three generations that just pass it on from one generation to the next. We're going to see that, unfortunately, Jephthah, though God's going to use him greatly, his woundedness is going to bring so much pain and misery into other lives. The next piece that we get to in the story, as we move on down the line in verse 3, says... <clears throat> so Jephthah ran away from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. Everybody say Tob. Most of us have been to Tob. And he goes on to say, worthless men. Everybody say worthless men. Oh, worthless men. We all know some worthless men, don't we? Worthless men gathered around Jephthah and they became his posse. Sometime afterwards... The Ammonites made war against Israel 
And when the Ammonites attacked Israel, Gilead's elders went to bring Jephthah back from the land of Tob. Now, you, you're following what's going on here. We jumped backwards in time when we started this chapter. We're, we're moving up to get us back caught up to where Israel has suffered for 18 years and they're crying out for relief. But we're, we're hearing what led up to that. So, you know, when the Ammonites attacked Israel and, and now it's been 18 years. And so Gilead's elders, they went to bring Jephthah back from the land of Tob. And they said to him, come be our commander so that we can fight against the Ammonites. And to just sum up how this exchange goes, uh, we find out apparently some of the the leaders of Israel who, after all these years, go chasing after Jephthah must have been his brothers based on the conversation that they have. How ironic is that? The same brothers that ran him off are, are going and saying, hey, come back and help us. You have to read some between the lines, but it do doesn't take a genius to figure out what has gone on here. Jephthah has left the region. He hadn't left the country, but he's left the region where he grew up. And, and he's gone to this place called Tob. It's his place of escape. And, and he's developed his own posse. Some bad boys. Rejects. Good for nothing guys. But they would be his friends. They were better than his brothers. And the writer of Judges doesn't tell us what they did. But it was bad. They had a dreadful reputation. It was so bad that when a foreign army came in and invaded, this guy who has never done anything civic-minded that we know of, who's never led in any good thing in his life, and when the people are, are talking about who in the world could fight off these beasts who have attacked us, somebody says, hey, or you remember all the stories you've heard about Jephthah and the posse that runs with him? How we've all been scared of them and nobody wanted to, to ever see them? <laughs> I wonder what would happen if he could come and lead our army. And somebody goes, that ain't such a bad idea. And they go and seek him out. And there's this whole exchange where Jephthah basically says, Oh man, you're just asking me to come in and help save the day. If I lead your army and we win anything, you're going to kick me out just like you did before. All you want is for me to be a military leader for a little while and then you're going to sack me. And they're like, no, no, no. We'll make you our ruler and you can remain our ruler, not just a military leader. You come in, you will be the man if you can lead us to run these Ammonites out of town. And so the next piece is he comes into town to seek to do that, to lead the army. But the thing that I want you to consider in this part of the story is the whole concept of him running to Tob and how he first begins to deal with the hurt that he's carrying in his life. Most everybody, if not all of us who've been deeply wounded in life, we have visited the land of Tob. Tob is where you run when you're hurting and you just desperately need to forget the hurt for a while. Tob may not be a place for you. Tob may be something that comes out of a bottle. For many of us, Tob isn't a place. Tob is a person. It's the relationship that you run to. You see, when we've been deeply wounded, it's always about a relationship. It's about a relationship that got violated, and it's almost always been violated by somebody who was clo closest to us, very close to us, because those are the people who always have the potential to hurt us the most because our hearts are so deeply connected to them. And so they're able to inflict really deep wounds in our lives, whether they meant to or not. And in trying to cope with that, we're going to find some way to numb the pain, to overcome the pain, and normally because it's a relationship fracture that's caused this wound, we're usually going to run either to a relationship that's going to make this feel better, quickly somebody come in and fill this hole for me, or we're going to grab for something that will very naturally numb pain. You don't have to be real smart to know the things that numb pain. Drugs, Alcohol and sex numb pain better than anything else that we know of. And those are the three things that we typically will run to most frequently when we're running to the land of Tob. We will either try and find comfort in a bottle, or we'll try and find comfort in pills, or most frequently, very frequently, we will run to the first relationship that we can get to, please, I... I got hurt by somebody who was supposed to love me. I feel unloved. Love me. Make me feel loved. And so many times, just like Jephthah, we won't go to a healthy place and find healthy people. 
We just find the first person who will show us something that resembles love. And when our hearts are crying, make me feel loved, you know what an unhealthy person will do in response to that? They'll think, I'll make you feel something. I'll make you feel something that resembles love, at least in the moment. And you know what winds up happening out of that. Just like Jephthah got tangled up in unhealthy relationships, he was hanging out with the wrong crowd, but he was hanging out with a crowd that would at least be faithful to him. They would hang with him. They were bad boys, but they were his boys. They met a real need in his life in that moment. And so, I mean, the way that we could probably best sum this up is to say living with bad company made Jephthah a stronger warrior and a weaker man. I'm just curious, and I'm sure not looking for answers out loud, but I wonder when you've been to the land of Tob, what did that look like for you? While you were there, there was a season you didn't hurt as bad, wasn't there? But did you find yourself becoming a weaker person because of what you did to numb the pain and to, to deal with that hurt? Now, I'm just going to say it straight. What we're talking about today is not a fun message. This one is not going to end with a poem and a happy song and we all go home. Tragically, some of us are still coping with and, and some even living in the parts of this whole land of Tob experience. That out of woundedness, we've run to relationships or run to, to something that was supposed to numb our pain and we're still living in that place. We're still in a relationship either close to or, you know, some distance from, but having to be connected to this person that was supposed to help us. And they didn't. They made it worse. We made ourselves worse by being connected to them. And you have kids by them or you get sexually entangled with them. And now you're just tangled up all these different ways emotionally and physically. And, and ah, oh, it, just, it just sticks to you like sticky gum or something. Find comfort in other things like booze or pills and you decide I think I'm probably overdoing this I probably need to quit but it's not so easy to quit and sometimes we felt better for a season because of what we did but we find out we're in a much worse place and we're not stronger people as a result of that that's what happened with Jephthah and then the story takes the most shocking twist it is the refreshing good news in the whole story we find out that Jephthah's past still didn't prevent him from being greatly used by God. This really is the sweet and encouraging part of the story. I mean, this guy is bad, bad news. I mean, we feel sorry for him because we know where he's come from. He's been so mistreated, but it's kind of like at some point you sort of go, mistreated or not, this is not somebody you want your daughter to marry. Amen? This is the guy you want to keep your daughter away from. You do not want to meet him on a dark street at night. You do not want him and his posse to come in your restaurant or in your place of business. Bad, bad guy. And yet, the really shocking turn in the story is we discover that in spite of his horrible background, terrible upbringing, all of this woundedness and dysfunction and how bad he seems to have turned out, here's the shocker. God has never given up on him. God has never quit pursuing him. God has never let go of the plan that he had for using Jephthah. Aren't you glad to know that this morning? Aren't you glad to know that the worst thing that you've ever done, that at times has made you go, I bet God is so sick of me. I bet God is done with me. I bet I have thwarted half of what God ever wanted to do with my life because of these decisions. Jephthah's story is a reminder to you and to me, God ain't done with you. You, don't you believe the lies of the enemy to, that God has just passed you by because you have screwed this up so badly? Even Jephthah, in spite of all of his junk, God was saying, I have a plan and I am still pursuing you. We read in verses 29 and following of chapter 11. As Jephthah has now, he, he has taken on the mantle of, of leading this whole huge group of people He's never done anything like this before. He's been a reject. And now he's actually dealing with the king of the foreign army. He's dealing with the head of the Ammonites. And they have this exchange. And it's clear they're going to have to fight it out. There's not going to be a diplomatic solution. And so now he's about to have to lead an army in battle against an overwhelming opponent. And all of this 
is sinking in on him. And he's realizing, ooh, this is a bad spot to be in. I feel ill-equipped for this. I don't think I'm big enough for this. And in that moment, the Lord's Spirit came on Jephthah. Isn't it interesting how consistently that God's Spirit comes on somebody. The angel of the Lord wrestles with somebody. God moves in somebody's life when they are at the point of total desperation. It's when he shows up in our lives so much of the time, isn't it? And so he crossed over to fight the Ammonites, now empowered by the Spirit of God, and the Lord handed them over to him. It was an exceptionally great defeat. He defeated 20 towns. Boy, that is a string of victories, isn't it? 20 different military victories that he led them in. I mean, he's just setting the whole region free as he leads the army. It's a really striking thing. But if that's all we knew of Jephthah, it would be very tempting to say, how much of that really was about God or faith or, or God somehow redeeming this guy? He's just a bad boy. He's just a mercenary that the leaders in Israel said, hey, he's bad enough. If we'll put him in charge for a little while, he'll just be like a junkyard dog leading us and we'll go win the, the victory. And it really doesn't matter what his heart's like. But, but we find out, God actually did a work in Jephthah's heart in all of this. And the biggest tip-off to this is Hebrews chapter 11. If you know Hebrews 11, you know in all of the Bible, this is the hall of fame of the people of faith. We call it the hall of faith. Twelve different men and women are recognized in the hall of faith as just ultimate examples of faith in God. The writer of Hebrews is telling us what the life of faith looks like. It, it's believing in what we can't see. It's being sure of these things that we're trusting God for. And, and he just starts rattling off all of these people. Abel and, and you know, Noah and Abraham and Moses and just the great faith that they have. And, and he's describing how they lived out their faith. And then you get to verses 32 and 33 as he's running through these 12 examples of great faith and he says and what more shall I say I don't have time to tell you about Gideon Barak Samson Jephthah Jephthah David Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms administered justice and gained what was promised you just don't get in taller company than Abraham, Moses, David, Samuel, and sandwiched between those, Jephthah. Son of a prostitute, outcast, rebel, bad boy, and yet God did a work in his life that not only helped to free his people, but really did a work in him to, to develop a true faith in God that was worthy of recounting for the people of God for the next 3,000 plus years. That's pretty striking, isn't it? I mean, granted, he didn't tell Jeff this whole story again in Hebrews, but that, that's one of the great, of all the characters in the Old Testament, that's one of the great men of faith that is remembered. The good news in that is just simply, wow, there's hope for us. In spite of our brokenness, God chooses to use all kinds of people but from that point forward, the story takes a sad downward turn. He has a real faith in God. He brings freedom for the people. Great victories are won. But here's the thing we can't pass over today. Jephthah's brokenness became the defining issue in the remainder of his life, at least everything that's recorded in the Scriptures. We see that even in battle the fifth part here, that Jephthah wrongly assumed that he must make a huge sacrifice in order for God to answer him. As Jephthah is about to go into battle, now he has come to know the one true God. He has a faith in that God, but his thinking is so twisted going all the way back to his childhood that he believes that the only way that he could actually expect anything of God is if he does something to impress God, to get God's attention. He's got to make some grand sacrifice to get God to act. And so he makes this declaration to God in verses 30 and 31. Jephthah promised the Lord, 
Don't miss this. If you've zoned out, zone back in for this. Here's Jephthah's promise to God. If you will give me victory over the Ammonites, I will burn as an offering the first person that comes out of my house to meet me when I come back from the victory. I will offer that person to you as a sacrifice. To what? This is your great appeal to God. Oh God, if you'll just give us the victory today, here's what I'll do just to get your attention, just to tell you how, how much I'm willing to go out on a limb for you. Whoever comes out of my house to greet me when I come home, the first one out the door, I will put them on the altar and I will offer them as a burnt offering. I will kill them for you and let their body be consumed with flames. We read that and go, are you kidding me? How could your thinking become that twisted? Good question. How could your thinking become that twisted? Well, here's part of the, the reason. All the pagan peoples around them had these very twisted views of God. You see, they didn't know the one true God. The God who loves us and who pursues us in spite of our sin. They believed in versions of God who were were evil and, and cruel and who expected child sacrifice as a part of, if you're going to, there's a, some kind of quid pro quo here. You know, if I'm going to do something for you, you're going to have to do something big for me. Make a big sacrifice for me if you want me, the God, to do something for you. And that thinking had become a part of his thinking. It's part of the bad deal of living in Tob, away from the people of God. Part of what's twisted about his thinking, though, is this. Our concept of God, this is true for us, our concept of God is so tied to the people who have, whom we have known best and who have loved and cared for us. Usually our parents have had a huge impact on that. God is Father, your Father has impacted how you see God. There have been some other key people in your life who, whether you realize it or not, the way you look at God has to do with how those people have treated you. It's why for some of us, if you've felt always distant and, and like, you know, the people who loved you the most still kept you kind of out here, you'll tend to, as an adult, feel like God's always holding you out here. If you've always felt like you got conditional love, it'll be very difficult to accept the fact that God loves you unconditionally. Well, think about the love that Jephthah got. I mean, his mother, wow, what did she know of love? His father, like, well, you're sort of my son. You can live at my house. I'm not going to stop my sons from using and abusing you. And when they finally run you out of town, I'm not going to chase after you. Okay, if that begins to shape your, your view of God, what do you think of God? Can you just imagine when Jephthah was 8, 10, 12, 13, 14 years old, can you imagine how many times he prayed to God and begged God to make it better? I mean, stop and think about that. How many times did this little kid just call out to a God that he didn't really know yet, but say, oh God, please make him stop. Please bring my mom back. God, why, why can't my mom and my dad be together? Well, why does everybody have to be so mean to me all the time? God, why does somebody not love me? How much must he have felt unloved by God because he felt so unloved by the people around him? So it shouldn't surprise us a little bit that when a grown-up Jephthah is put in a desperate situation where he knows that he has to call on God, that all of that thinking doesn't suddenly go away. That he can't trust in a God who loves him and who is just going to show up and give him what he needs just because he's a good God and he loves Jephthah and he loves his people. He has no concept of that. He, he's twisted by all of these things and he's thinking, I need God badly. And if, if I'm going to expect God to help me, I mean, he's never really helped me before, so I'm going to have to do something to jumpstart this process. I guess I'll just, I'll just have to offer him a member of my own family. I'll, just, I'll make a promise like the other people I've heard of who made big promises to God. God, I'll just kill whoever comes out the door of my house. Maybe that'll get your attention nothing ever has before and it is no joking matter that some of you though you'd never offer a, a live human sacrifice to God there are some of you who feel a Jephthah level of desperation about ever getting the attention of God because you've been hurt so deeply or you've been forced to live for so long in a situation that doesn't make sense. And it's not fair. And it's making you miserable. 
and you've cried out to God, you have begged God, please step in, please help me, please change this person, please change this situation, and it has not happened. It feels like you have been knocking on heaven's door and nobody's answering. And your response hasn't been, well, God, I'll just offer one of my kids as a sacrifice to you. But in spite of that, your heart has been just as deeply impacted as Jephthah's. And we get to a place where we feel like, I mean, something's wrong here. Either God doesn't care, or I don't matter, or I don't know how to do this. Maybe I don't belong to him. Maybe God is toward me the way Jephthah's dad was toward him. Maybe I'm a, maybe I'm a stepchild in this relationship. I don't know. And, and a lot of times, we just don't get an answer. It's just like, I don't know, but something is broke. It's just not working. And we tend to make really bad decisions in those situations. Jephthah did. Made a horrible decision. He made a commitment that he never should have made. And worse than that, he followed through on his commitment. We find out the next piece in the story that Jephthah's unaddressed wounds caused great harm to those near him. In verse 34, it says, When Jephthah, this after God gave the great victories, when Jephthah came to his house in Mizpah, it was his daughter who came out to meet him with tambourines and dancing. Can't you just picture this? His only child hears that dad's coming. She sees him out the window in the distance coming. She grabs up musical instruments. She is dancing and celebrating. It's, it's unbelievable. My dad, the one that's been so rejected and who's had so much pain in his life, finally my dad is getting what he deserves and she comes out to celebrate with her dad. She was an only child. And when she came out to meet her dad, his heart is broken. I mean, all the while, as he's coming back, you can just imagine the lump in his throat, the way his heart is racing as he's going, oh, who's going to come out the door? Who's coming out the door? I, d don't let it be my little girl. Just don't let it be her. And when she charges out, he's just crushed. And he tells her why. And as we're reading this, it's like, Come on, man. Wake up. What are you thinking? Take back the vow. This is not something that would honor God or that God would want you to do. But you see, his thinking is so twisted. Oh, I've got to do this thing. I've got to follow through. And he tells his daughter. And his daughter essentially says, well, I mean, she knows she can't stop it. And she says, well, Dad, I, I know you're going to do what you're going to do. But would you just give me two months? I'm young. still a virgin. Would you give me two months just that I could go with my friends into the hills and just grieve what's about to happen? And so he lets her do that. And after two months, she comes back and she submits to her dad. And he kills her. And he offers her up as a sacrifice. And if that's not bad enough, we get one more little paragraph on Jephthah. One more strange little paragraph. The Ephraimites, you see Gilead's not a tribe, it's just a region that's part Manasseh, part Ephraim. The Ephraimites say, hey, we heard about the great victory that you just won. You're getting all the glory. We didn't get to take part in that. We're pretty ticked about it. You didn't call on us. So we're coming to burn your house down. Sounds like the big bad wolf talking, you know. And Jephthah is not a healthy thinking person at this point. And he's pretty much like, uh, I don't think so. And he says, oh, I asked y'all for help and you wouldn't come and help. There's no record of that, but we don't know if he's lying or telling the truth. And so rather than talk through this, Jeff is like, I'm not taking anything off these people. I don't care if they are my own people. So he calls out his own army, his own posse now, and he's like, we're going to do battle with them. And he goes and he wins a great victory. Maybe, maybe he could have avoided that. Maybe it was necessary. But the really wicked twist in it is, after the army that follows Jephthah goes and fights with the Ephraimites and they, they win a victory, he circles around behind and he sets a trap at the ford of the river where the people who are, who are fleeing, they're, you know, the Ephraimite army, you can just imagine, they're like, what were we thinking? What are we fighting about? We're fighting because we didn't get called out to the first battle? Duh. I mean, this is not even a standing army. This is just, 
Ordinary people who come out and fight in times of desperation, and they're like, forget this. We're going home to our families. We're done with fighting. They're just trying to retreat and get back home. And Jephthah says, no, come on, guys. We know where they're going to go to get back home. They've got to get to the shallow spot in the river to cross over and get back home. So we're going to set up camp there. And one or two at a time, as they flee to go home, we're going to stop them. And we're going to figure out everyone who's an Ephraimite so that we can kill them. And there's this bizarre little thing. Apparently the Ephraimites spoke with a little bit of a different accent. And so there's this little trick that they do. Every time they catch somebody at the ford in the river, they would say, hey, say the word Shubaleth. For some reason, people from Ephraim, the, the sheen, the Hebrew letter that the word started with, could be pronounced as S-H or S. Ephraimites would say it with an S. And so anybody who, when they said, hey, what do you call a so-and-so? And the answer is Shibboleth. If they said Sibboleth, they'd be like, you're an Ephraimite, kill him. 42,000 men died. That's a large part of the whole makeup of that tribe, the, the male makeup of that tribe. 42,000 put to death in a trap set by Jephthah. And that's the end of the Jephthah story. Misery. Unnecessary loss. Pain inflicted by a broken man whose wounds were never addressed. I mean, the conclusion of the Jephthah story is just one verse. Jephthah led Israel six years, and then Jephthah the Gileadite died, and he was buried in a town in Gilead. Bottom line, Israel got some relief for a little while. Some people got some relief. But to read the whole of the story, you realize, wow, this man who knew God, who had a faith in God, he had such unaddressed issues in his life that he hurt or killed as many people as he ever helped or ministered to, maybe a lot more. And tragically, there was nobody he hurt worse than his own family took the life of his own daughter. Now, it's easy for us to look at that and say, well, goodness, I would never do that. No, we'd never offer our children as a sacrifice on an altar of fire. And yet, we couldn't begin to count how many people around us, how many of us, have in a sense offered up our kids on a different altar. How much we've sacrificed them to the God of a great career to the God of money, to the God of whatever that wasn't family. Out of our, how many times, you know, out of our own brokenness have we brought, brought great pain and suffering into the lives of our kids? I mean, we've, we've been talking about this in terms of what are the wounds that have affected us by the people who are closest to us. But here's the really tragic thing is wounded people wound people. There are a bunch of us here today and listening today. Yeah, we got wounded. And that never got addressed. And we were lied to when somebody said, time heals all hurts. It does not. And out of that woundedness, we've brought, brought many of us great suffering in the lives of our kids. It's really a weird twist in the story that a great deal is made, it's mentioned repeatedly, about the fact that Jephthah's daughter was a virgin she died a virgin, a young woman who had never known intimacy. I started wondering, why does it keep mentioning that? I really felt like the Spirit was saying, just trace that back a couple of generations. We're introduced to Jephthah's mom. She was anything but a virgin. She was a prostitute, but she was a woman who didn't know intimacy. Sadly, who had little clue of what intimacy was like. She was living out of brokenness. Had a baby with a man who we don't know what his deal was, but he obviously didn't know how to love unconditionally, didn't, didn't model love well to their child, passed all this woundedness and brokenness on to their son Jephthah, who then, he didn't know how to love and protect his own daughter. He wasn't protected. He wasn't loved the way that he should be. And when he made a stupid statement, he made a stupid commitment that he never should have made and that he should have just zeroed out and canceled out and simply asked forgiveness for, for making a rash promise instead would watch his own daughter die rather than to retract what he had said and look bad in the process. 
and the daughter dies knowing no intimacy a victim of brokenness just like her dad never knew real intimacy a victim of brokenness his mother a victim of brokenness I mean what situation led her to become a prostitute? Do you begin to have a feel for how this thing just passes from generation to generation unless somebody comes along and says, I am not going to let this continue in my family line. I'm not going to let my woundedness cause me to do great harm to my children, to my spouse and the circle of people who are closest to me. I'm going to do something about this. The whole story is set in Gilead. It's not a place we hear much about in the Bible. So just a little region just east of the Jordan. There's a mountain there. Gilead, one of the few things we ever hear about Gilead is that uh, there was a particular plant that grew there. It was really rare. It's written about a ton in ancient history. A particular kind of balsam tree. And the sap from, and it's really more of a vine than a tree, but, but the sap from this stuff was just considered almost magical. It had such medicinal power to bring healing. It was known as the balm of Gilead. You've probably heard that phrase before. It was incredibly rare. In fact, some of the, the writers during the a period much later, during the uh, period when the Romans were in control, vast Roman Empire, and it's recorded that there were only two places in all of the Roman Empire where this plant grew that you could extract this, uh, the sap that had such powerful uh, healing uh, impact that you could put it on a wound and it would have such healing power. In fact, it, it's recorded that there was one little grove of 20 acres and one much smaller garden that in all the Roman Empire, these two little groups of balsam trees were the only place in the whole Roman Empire that it could be found. It was incredibly valuable. From that, you would get the balm of Gilead. It was like the super penicillin in the ancient world. It's interesting to note that while Gilead, and the story of what took place in Gilead, it is a story of woundedness, of pain, suffering and loss and yet out of the same place comes this source of, of such great relief and of great healing many many years later centuries later Jeremiah would write in another time of great distress in Jeremiah 8:22, he said is there no balm in Gilead is there no physician there why then is there no healing for the wound of my people He's crying out in a figurative sense, but he's talking about something that the people understood. It's like, we, we are a hurting people. We, we are such a broken people. And, and Jeremiah, known as the weeping prophet, he's crying out on behalf of the people of God. And he's saying, what is, what's wrong with us? God, why, why can we find no comfort? Why can we find no healing? We, we just live in misery. And we generate more misery. Oh God, is there no balm in Gilead? Is, is there no healing for us? Why are God's people not healed from their wounds? Jeremiah's words have never been more fitting than they are today. God's people are wounded. We are. I mean, the stuff that we read about that's broken in American culture, the thing that's staggering is how the numbers inside the church look so exactly like the numbers outside the church. The things that are causing such hurt. I mean, you, you name it. I'm not trying to pick on anybody, but whatever you want to name. Divorce or pregnancy out of wedlock or alcohol abuse or you know, drug abuse or whatever all addiction to pornography all of these things that get us so tangled up and messed up which by the way most of them wind up being ways that we attempt to medicate the deepest wounds in our lives we use the wrong stuff as freely in the church as people outside the church do and we ought to be praying the prayer of Jeremiah. We ought to be at least asking the questions. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no healing power? Let me translate that question. 
Is there no healing power, no healing salve for the people of God among the people of God? Why is it that God's people are so wounded without remedy? Don't you think that's a good question? Let's just strip everything else away and get down to the real truth. For my lifetime, anyway, I can only account for the last 47 years, but I know this about my lifetime in America. In the American church, rather than, than there being much of an offering of real balm, something to supply real healing for real hurts in the church, that has not been what church has been about. Church has been a gathering of people who either had it together or we could at least get it together for Sunday morning and look good on Sunday morning. And the main requirement to being a part of Sunday morning was get your act together, put on your Sunday best, and when somebody asks how you doing, you say, blessed, brother, how are you doing? And that doesn't help broken people at all. Hurting people go home hurting. And worse still, you want to know what hurting people do to that? They stay away. Because they say, you don't have any balm in Gilead. You, you don't have anything to soothe and really heal my hurts. So hopefully time's going to take care of this. And tragically, for the deep wounds, time does not. Don't you know that's the truth? If time would have healed all hurts, we'd be great people by today, wouldn't we? We're still hurting. We're still operating out of this woundedness. What are we to do? Is there no healing for God's people? There is healing. The church has not been real good at tapping into this. Where is it found? Well, I mean, obviously, part of the healing is found in Christ himself. That is, that is the biggest key. There, there's an old black spiritual from the uh, mid-1800s that... that rehearses the line there is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole there is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin sick soul it's so true Jesus is quite literally the balm of Gilead he is the one who ministers to our deepest woundedness but I mean here's really the the crux of the matter most of the people in the room we know Jesus Jephthah knew the Lord Getting saved and knowing who Jesus is and actually having him as your Lord doesn't take away all of the deepest wounds in your life. We are wounded warriors. We started with that thought, the wounded warrior project. I want you to think for a minute to the real battlefield. In the battlefield, when somebody gets wounded, you've seen the movies. What's the first thing you hear shouted when an, a limb is blown off, when there's a serious injury? Medic. That's it. Medic! What is that cry? What does it mean? What's it about? It, yeah, it's a call for help. But it means specifically, we need somebody who is specialized in dealing with this kind of wound on the spot. We don't just need anybody from the army. We need the people who are trained in this to come in and help to deal with this wound. You know what the church needs to start learning how to do? We need to learn when to scream, Medic! I'm hurting. I need help. We've learned the opposite on Sundays. Instead of saying, medic, I'm good. It's all good. Isn't there something missing down there? Oh, you know, <laughs> forgot and left that piece at home, you know. Aren't you missing a leg or missing an arm? I'm good. Ignore that blood. We'll clean that up later. Except it's not our bodies. It's our, it's our hearts. It's our minds that are so wounded. I've got good news for you. The church today is reclaiming the role of medic. We've got some people who are trained and who know the skills to help you deal with the deepest wounds in your life. You hear us talk about it all the time. It is not just a silver bullet, but when you hear us talking about Celebrate Recovery, the reason we are constantly channeling people there is we have trained, skilled people who devote all of their energy to this process. There is a biblical plan for healing. You don't have to get it through the 12 steps, but the 12 steps are a systematic plan for you experiencing biblical Christ-centered healing. 
where in this process you go back and you learn and understand this woundedness and where it came from and how do I get closure on this? How do I really begin to let this thing heal in my life? When you hear us say frequently, hey, CR is for all of life's hurts, habits, and hang-ups. How can that be? Because it is a systematic plan for helping us press into Christ, realizing time and my efforts won't fix all of this. I need Jesus but to heal this. But it's not just Jesus sort of in a vacuum. Jesus always does this healing work using other people. Today isn't designed just to be a gigantic commercial for Celebrate Recovery, but to say, just saying a little prayer ain't going to get it done. For some of the deepest wounds and brokenness that we have, Celebrate Recovery would be a great doorway. And I keep pointing this way because John and Sally are over here and they've headed that program for years for us. CR is one great doorway for that. For some of you, it's not going to be through CR. It's going to be with a Christian counselor. For some of you, it's going to be with a trusted Christian brother or sister that you begin to get honest with about what you've struggled with, what that hurt is, and the stuff that's never been fully laid to rest in your life. The old line, revealing the feeling is the beginning of healing, is so true. Just to begin to be honest about what you're struggling with. And how that's coming out in your life and letting God begin to minister healing through another person is key in this. I don't know what you're carrying, but most all of us are carrying something. And the good news is God doesn't, isn't going to allow that to sidetrack his ability to use you. He doesn't want you to just carry that hurt for the rest of your life. But he's going to use other people if you'll cooperate in the process. He wants to use other people to bring healing into your life.